Part 2 The Pure Theory of Investment Value Chapter IV Does the Quantity Theory of Money Apply to Stock Prices? I. Fisher's Equation The simplest explanation of the effect of money on price is given by the so-called quantity theory of money, usually expressed by Fisher's well-known equation of exchange mv equals pt where m equals quantity of money v equals velocity of circulation p equals price level t equals volume of trade fisher includes in the volume of trade all sales of consumers goods to the public all sales of raw materials to manufacturers all payments for wages interest rent and profits all taxes all dealings in real estate and securities in short all cash transactions of any kind whatsoever fisher says that other things being equal, an increase in the quantity of money will cause a rise in the general price level, and that the increase in money and in prices will be exactly proportionate. Hence, if certain prices refuse to rise, others must rise all the more, in order that the average of all prices shall rise in the required proportion. Although in some quarters it is the fashion nowadays to poo-poo the quantity theory, the fact remains that the modern theories of Keynes, Hotry, and many others are only revisions of the original quantity theory, whose beginning goes back almost as far as economics itself. Because all these versions of the quantity theory inevitably raise the question of the extent to which security values are affected by the quantity of money, no outline of the theory of investment value would be complete without an inquiry into the way in which stocks and bonds are dependent on the present and prospective purchasing power of money. This chapter and also chapters 8 and X will be devoted to this subject. 2. Can inflation strike anywhere? Because Fisher said that real estate and securities, as well as finished and unfinished goods, must be included in the equation of exchange, and because he seemed to imply that if one price does not rise in response to an increase in the quantity of money, another must, and must rise all the more, there is a notion abroad in the land, a false and misleading notion to the effect that inflation is capricious, that it may strike here, there, or anywhere, that it may cause a rise either in commodity prices, as in this country in 1915 to 1920, or in real estate, as in Florida in 1925, or in stocks, as in Wall Street in 1928 and 1929, but that it is in any event a mechanical result of the increase in the quantity of money. Although this view is not accepted by all writers on monetary theory, it is widely held in financial circles, where the opinion is frequently expressed that inflation in this country, as a result of our huge excess reserves, is likely soon to take the form of a wild speculative boom in the stock market. In a speech on October 9, 1935 Charles R. Gay, president of the New York Stock Exchange, said, The position today is entirely sound from the standpoint of credit directly employed in the security markets. It should be kept so. I am not an alarmist, but we should not close our eyes to the inflammability of the material we are dealing with and to the fact that inflation, if it should once get started, might sweep through the markets as a fire sweeps through a city of wooden houses. This passage has been widely quoted by financial commentators, and has been interpreted as meaning that inflation the next time may well manifest itself primarily in the stock market. 3. The quantity of money and the price of stocks with the notion that the present excess reserves of the banking system cause low interest rates and tend to make stocks sell high no one should quarrel, but with the notion that these same excess reserves portend an increase in the quantity of money soon which increase will act upon stocks according to a quantity theory of money and prices, we should disagree. When Mr. Gay says, given a sufficient degree of confidence, or perhaps of desperation, or even of reckless boredom over the prolonged idleness of money, a situation could develop which would threaten the gravest consequences through an upward flight of security prices, he seems to imply that excess reserves might breed excess bank deposits which would flow into the stock market and cause inflation in stock prices. That stock prices would rise merely because of an increase in the quantity of money, we should deny. For we maintain that stock prices will rise only because people think stocks are worth more. The quantity of money, as we shall show, has nothing to do with the price of stocks. Thus stocks are different from goods and services, for the price of goods and services is proportional to the quantity of money in circulation between producers and consumers. 
An increase in the quantity of money is neither a necessary nor a sufficient condition for a rise in the price of stocks. It is not necessary, because stock prices can rise by sales that involve no use of money, by sales between traders using only bookkeeping entries on brokers' books. Thus, if John Doe owns American Telephone, now quoted at 160, and Richard Rowe owns Allied Chemical, now quoted at the same price, there is nothing to prevent them from exchanging these stocks at 180 next month without the use of any money at all, if each buys and sells within the same trading day. If investors generally trade back and forth with each other, continually becoming more optimistic, just such a rise as this will occur. In fact, this is just what took place during most of the 1935-36 bull movement. Stock prices in general rose without the use of any new credit to finance the rise. Clearly an increase in the quantity of money is not a necessary condition for a rise in stock prices. Neither is it a sufficient condition. No matter if bank deposits increased, stocks would not go up if people become more pessimistic. Payment of the soldier's bonus, for instance, might increase the quantity of money, but stock prices might still go down, if the bonus bill carried a heavy tax on dividends, for example. Evidently the quantity of money does not determine the price of stocks. This is not to say that the making or calling of loans on stocks does not affect their price. But loans on stocks are not money, being neither currency nor bank deposits. Loans are bank assets, while currency and deposits are bank liabilities. Loans on stocks, moreover, can be made, directly or indirectly, by investors, savings banks, insurance companies, and other non-banking lenders, and in this case no increase in demand deposits results, and no change in the quantity of money occurs. Even if loans are made by commercial banks, the proceeds of the loans will be used to pay off the seller of the stocks, who will then use his receipts either to pay off his own bank loans, in which case no effect on the general price level will occur, or to buy goods and services, in which case the loan is like any other bank loan in causing commodity prices, rather than stocks, to rise. In short, stocks rise because people think they are worth more, but commodities rise because buyers have more money wherewith to buy them. For stocks, the quantity theory does not apply, for goods and services it does, at least to some extent. In this respect stocks are like real estate, whose price is also independent of the quantity of money, save indirectly as this quantity determines the money incomes of consumers and thus the earning power of land and buildings. So rapid can be the velocity of circulation of money in both the stock market and the real estate market that neither stocks nor real estate need ever wait for an increase in the quantity of money in order to rise in price, and no shortage of money need ever keep prices down in these markets. Inflation, therefore, can occur only in the prices of goods and services. But inflation so occurring will affect stock prices indirectly. It will make the selling price of manufactured goods rise, and will force up wages and other expenses. In the end it will increase profits and dividends in terms of depreciated money. Hence stocks will rise in price because they are worth more in terms of depreciated money. But they will rise because they are worth more, not because there is more money wherewith to buy them, and inflation outside the stock market, not within it, will make them rise. Furthermore, the rise should occur largely step by step with, and not in anticipation of, inflation in the prices of goods and services, as will be shown in a later chapter. The market for consumers' goods, or for the machines and raw materials that are used in making them, is quite different from the market for stocks and real estate, because the production and consumption of goods, unlike the purchase and sale of stocks and real estate, is a time-consuming process, and as a result the circulation of money to finance this process is also a time-consuming process in the same degree. In this process, both producer and consumer are obliged to restrict the velocity of circulation of money coming into their hands, and neither can spend his income with indiscriminate speed. The producer, on his part, when he collects his receivables, must hold the proceeds in cash in order to meet his payroll at the end of the week or month. If he should chance to collect his money one day earlier or later, he must then hold on to it one day more or less, because always he must pay his wages on the same day of the week or month. Hence the process of meeting the payroll, which is one of the most important uses for money, 
becomes at the same time a process for stabilizing the velocity of circulation of money. The consumer, on his part also, when he receives his wages, must hold the proceeds in cash at first and must spend the money only a little at a time, in order to make sure that it shall last until the next payday, so that his family shall not have to go hungry for the last day or so. If he spends rapidly at first, he must spend all the more slowly later. Hence the process of buying the family supplies, which, like that of meeting the payroll, is one of the most important uses for money becomes at the same time a process for stabilizing the velocity of circulation of money. The economic mechanism may be likened to a watch that keeps time properly because it contains a balance wheel and hairspring, actuated by an escapement, which together prevent the mainspring from unwinding more than just so fast. In the economic mechanism the payroll envelope and the housewife's purse are the two pallets on the escapement lever. With both producers and consumers, it should be clearly noted, the amount of money which is kept on hand in any particular day of the week or month, whether to meet the coming pay roll or to buy tomorrow's food and clothing, is determined not by considerations of convenience, but of necessity. It is only the exceptional producer or consumer who is not pressed for cash and who does not lie from hand to mouth financially. Rare indeed are those who, in Marshall's words, are thrifty enough to be able to say that a large command of resources in the form of currency renders business easy and smooth, and puts them at an advantage in bargaining. But, on the other hand, it locks up in a barren form resources that might yield an income of gratification if invested, say, in furniture, or a money income, if invested in extra machinery or cattle. To say that the cash balances held by producers and consumers are a matter of convenience, or to imply that most people have any choice in these matters, is utterly to miss the point whatever cash most people have in their purses or their checking accounts they are compelled to have there in order to pay their bills when the time comes. In consequence it may be said that the velocity of circulation of most cash balances is habitually kept at the maximum figure that the ingenuity of producers and consumers can devise under the existing customs of the country concerning the frequency of pay days, salary days, rent days, and settlement days for charge accounts, and that nothing could substantially increase the velocity of circulation of such cash and deposits as actually do circulate at all in the proper meaning of the term except to make pay days come daily instead of weekly, salary and rent days weekly instead of monthly, and tax days monthly instead of yearly. Nothing else would really alter the velocity of circulation of money appreciably. But even then, what could be done about the farmers? whose crops mature but once a year and who could hardly be paid more often than that. Seldom is money withdrawn from circulation in the ordinary processes of production and consumption, saving and investment, except for one single reason, speculation. If people are speculating on the bare side, as during deflation, they withdraw part of their cash receipts from circulation while they wait for lower prices on stocks, bonds, real estate, and speculative commodities. But if people are speculating on the bull side, as during inflation and a flight from the currency, they likewise withdraw part of their cash receipts from circulation in productive channels and use the money for buying existing supplies of land, machinery, raw materials, and finished goods. In either case, cash receipts are withdrawn from production and consumption, with the result that the real income of the community tends to shrink. Since the velocity of circulation of non-hoarded money within the productive process is substantially constant, it follows that the price level for goods and services produced by this process is independent of the velocity of circulation of money, hence this price level must be determined only by the quantity of money as compared with the volume of goods and services. In other words, the price level for consumers' goods depends only on the money income of consumers used to buy these goods. Likewise, the price level for producers' goods depends only on the money incomes of producers, which in turn are derived mainly from their sales of finished goods to consumers. As a result, the entire price level for all goods and services is determined almost wholly by the quantity of money in circulation and the volume of production. The price level for stocks and bonds and real estate, however, which are not produced and consumed, and are not bought out of income, and do not require time for passing from one purchaser to the next as goods in process of manufacture do, and which can even be, swapped, back and forth between traders at rising prices without the use of any cash at all. The price level for these things, to repeat, 
which represent mere claims to future money payments, does not depend on the quantity of money in circulation. For such things as stocks and bonds, therefore, with which we are primarily concerned in this book, it may correctly be said that no such thing as the quantity theory of money applies. Chapter versus evaluation by the rule of present worth I. Future dividends, coupons, and principal now that we have disposed of the troublesome misconception that stock prices are somehow determined in accordance with a quantity theory of money, we are at last ready to take up the main thesis of this book. Let us define the investment value of a stock as the present worth of all the dividends to be paid upon it. Likewise let us define the investment value of a bond as the present worth of its future coupons and principal. In both cases, dividends, our coupons and principal, must be adjusted for expected changes in the purchasing power of money. The purchase of a stock or bond, like other transactions which give rise to the phenomenon of interest, represents the exchange of present goods for future goods, dividends, our coupons and principal, in this case being the claim on future goods. To appraise the investment value, then, it is necessary to estimate the future payments. The annuity of payments, adjusted for changes in the value of money itself, may then be discounted at the pure interest rate demanded by the investor. This definition of investment value can be expressed by the following equations. The way in which dividends, our coupons and principal, should be adjusted for changes in the value of money in future years will be discussed later. 2. Future earnings of stocks Most people will object at once to the foregoing formula for stocks by saying that it should use the present worth of future earnings, not future dividends. But should not earnings and dividends both give the same answer under the implicit assumptions of our critics? If earnings not paid out in dividends are all successfully reinvested at compound interest for the benefit of the stockholder, as the critics imply, then these earnings should produce dividends later. If not, then they are money lost. Furthermore, if these reinvested earnings will produce dividends, then our formula will take account of them when it takes account of all future dividends, but if they will not, then our formula will rightly refrain from including them in any discounted annuity of benefits. Earnings are only a means to an end, and the means should not be mistaken for the end. Therefore we must say that a stock derives its value from its dividends, not its earnings. In short, a stock is worth only what you can get out of it. Even so spoke the old farmer to his son. A cow for her milk, a hen for her eggs, and a stock, by heck, for her dividends. An orchard for fruit, bees for their honey, and stocks, besides, for their dividends. The old man knew where milk and honey came from, but he made no such mistake as to tell his son to buy a cow for her cud or bees for their buzz. In saying that dividends, not earnings, determine value, we seem to be reversing the usual rule that is drilled into every beginner's head when he starts to trade in the market, namely, that earnings, not dividends, make prices. The apparent contradiction is easily explained, however, for we are discussing permanent investment, not speculative trading, and dividends for years to come, not income for the moment only. Of course it is true that low earnings together with a high dividend for the time being should be looked at askance, but likewise it is true that these low earnings mean low dividends in the long run. On analysis, therefore, it will be seen that no contradiction really exists between our formula using dividends and the common precept regarding earnings. How to estimate the future dividends for use in our formula is, of course, the difficulty. In later chapters ways of making an estimate will be given for such stocks as we now know how to deal with. In so doing, this book seeks to make its most important contribution to investment analysis. 3. Personal versus Market rate of interest In applying the foregoing formulas, each investor should use his own personal rate of interest. If one investor demands 10% and another 2% as minimum wages of abstinence, then the same stock or bond will be accorded a lower value by the one than by the other. The only case in which the market rate of interest should be applied is when the analyst is speaking not for himself personally but for investors in general. Then he should use the pure interest rate as it is expected to be found in the open market in the years to come. Registered for Compound interest at a changing rate In the usual discussion of compound interest, 
it is always assumed that the rate of interest stays the same throughout the period in question. The assumption of a changing rate is never met with, and apparently the possibility of such a thing is not even considered. Registered yet in theory a changing rate is easily conceivable, and so provision for it, when it occurs, should be made in our formula. Thus, the interest rate in every case is that for one-year loans made at the beginning of the year t, and paid at the end of it. The meaning of the equation can be shown by an example. Suppose that investors think that the interest rate for one-year loans, as determined by the equilibrium of the demand and supply for new savings, will be I1 equals half a percent in 1937 I2 equals 1 percent in 1938 I3 equals 1 and a half percent in 1939 I4 equals 2 percent in 1940 I5 equals 2 and a half percent in 1941 I6 equals 3 percent in 1942 then the present worth of pi dollars payable at the end of 1937 will be pi 100 and a half percent at the end of 1938 will be pi 100 and a half percent 101% at the end of 1939 will be pi 100 and a half percent 101 percent 101 and a half percent long-term interest rates are not a genus wholly distinct from short-term interest rates and they are not determined separately from short-term rates by independent considerations rather long-term rates are only a thing derived an average of a special kind a mere figure of substitution that can be used in place of the series of short-term rates for the years covered this average is not an ordinary arithmetic average, nor even a geometric average, but is a more complicated average whose formula is given implicitly by the formula for the value of the bond or stock under consideration. 5. Rights and assessments in the case of growing companies, rights to subscribe to additional shares may be offered from time to time and this will affect the annuity of payments received by the stockholder. Such an issue of rights is equivalent to a stock dividend paid to the stockholder together with an assessment levied on him. Since it is well recognized that a stock dividend, like a split up, does not change the values behind a given percentage of a company's stock, it follows that an offering of rights, in so far as it increases the number of shares outstanding but leaves unchanged the percentage owned by each stockholder, adds nothing to the value of the stockholder's equity. And in so far as the offering brings new money into the company's treasury, it is like any other assessment in building up the stockholder's equity. But in so far as the offering draws this money out of the stockholder's pocket, it increases the total cost of his commitment. This latter fact is clearly reflected by the change in the market worth of an issue of stock when it goes x rights. Then the new value of the entire issue becomes greater than that of the old by exactly the amount of new money paid in, and the stockholders' bank accounts become less by the same amount. The operation is thus exactly the opposite of the payment of a cash dividend, in that the payment of dividends reduces the value of the stockholders' investment and increases the value of their bank accounts, while the exercise of rights does the reverse. But, it may be asked, will not the new money collected by the company be invested at a good profit, and so will not the stock rise as the profits accrue in the future? No, it may be answered, the rise will not occur in the future, because it has already occurred in the past. The price does not ordinarily wait for the profits to accrue, or even for the funds to be collected, but responds as soon as the investment opportunity appears because usually there is no question as to the power of a company to secure such new money as may be needed to enable it to exploit any new opportunities that may arise. For established companies, the mechanism of issuing rights to take advantage of recognized opportunities for profit is known to be so sure that when the feat is successfully accomplished each time, the market sees no cause for surprise elation. The assessment is viewed as merely a routine operation in the company's growth. That the word, assessment, used above carries an invidious connotation is true. The word, contribution, could have been used instead, but such a choice of terms would have been less challenging to old views. Just because my opponents call the contribution a right, I shall retort by calling it an assessment. In either case, however, innuendo obscures the real facts. Assessments and dividends are opposite aspects of the same thing differing only with respect to the direction in which the money flows. A company which pays liberal cash dividends and offers frequent rights should not be considered doubly generous, the usual interpretation of such a policy, 
but rather as taking back with one hand what it doles out with the other. Its gross dividend is offset by an assessment which often makes its net dividend very small, or even negative. Nevertheless, such a course does not affect the intrinsic, long-run value of the stock, for, be it remembered, the investment value of a common stock is the present worth of its net dividends to perpetuity. Rights should not be treated as income. Methods of evaluation based on such a treatment involve endless difficulties and often certain bad errors. A method which assumes, for instance, that the investor is to sell some of his rights to provide cash for subscribing with the rest makes it necessary to know the price at which these rights can be sold, and thus also the price of the stock at intervals during the period treated. If the past is drawn upon, as is sometimes done, to provide a figure for the worth of rights, then the answer becomes dependent on the general level of stock prices prevailing in the past, with the result that this method of evaluation becomes of no use in estimating the price which should prevail in the future. Not what has been but what should be the price of a given stock is our problem, and we must not use the widely fluctuating and hence mostly incorrect prices of the past as data in our calculations. The relation which exists between gross dividends, subscriptions, and net dividends may be expressed by the following equation. 3a pi equals kappa sigma where pi equals pure, or net, dividend in any given year per share kappa equals actual, or gross, dividend in any given year sigma equals subscription, or assessment in any given year asterisk per share of original stock if no rights are issued in a particular year then the assessment, or subscription, in that year will be nil, and sigma equals zero. It usually happens that assessments are large but infrequent, hence in the years when they do occur, sigma exceeds kappa and pi becomes temporarily negative. Even though the assessments do not come every year, however, and even though they are spaced at irregular intervals, we may still treat them as items in an annuity, a negative one this time, and then find their present worth, and deduct this sum from the present worth of the gross dividends, to get a figure for the fair value of a stock. Thus, from the foregoing discussion of the place of rights in the evaluation of common stocks, it should be clear that nothing but cash dividends ought to be included in the formulas for appraisal, and that neither rights nor stock dividends nor option warrants nor any other form of distribution should be considered except in terms of the cash payments to which it may later give rise. 6. The formation point for income if, as argued above, assessments add to the value of one's stockholdings only so much as they subtract from one's bank account, and if dividends do only the opposite, how can either operation add to one's wealth, and how can anyone get rich from his stockholdings? Surely income accrues sometime, somewhere. The behavior of stock prices indicates, and reason confirms, the conclusion that a man's income arises and his wealth increases at that point in the chain between customer and stockholder where a company's earnings reach its cash account. When a corporation, after making and paying for its wares and selling them at a profit, finally collects the cash due on them, then at last it realizes its profit. From that moment on, shareholders may take their money at will. The date of distribution does not matter. But when the dividend is once allotted, on that day the stock goes ex dividend by the amount of the payment, and then what a man gains in cash assets he loses in invested assets. The reason for drawing the line at the time when profits reach the cash account instead of earlier in their development is because at the cash stage they are no longer among the earning assets of a business. Plant, inventories, receivables, all in their proper proportions, make up a going concern and are expected to earn a higher return than cash assets. Cash assets, however, if loaned in the money market, yield the same return to all companies, just as they would to their individual stockholders, but invested assets yield varying returns to different companies. A stockholder does not give his cash to a corporation to be lent for him, but to be invested in bricks and mortar, or in current assets. He can do his own lending. When profits are still in the form of invested assets, their final cash equivalent is uncertain, but when they reach the cash account, their exact amount is known, and no variation results from the mere processes of distribution or contribution. Hence the place to draw the line is between cash and other assets. Of course if cash piles up in a company's treasury, and is then spent again, unwisely this time, 
that is another story, and the stockholders' wealth decreases when the unwise expenditure is made. It still remains true, nevertheless, that the stockholders' wealth had previously increased when operations succeeded in yielding a cash profit. Investment value and market price 7 The value of a right after each assessment, or offering of new stock, the old shares go X rights, and change their value because the number of shares and the cash assets of the company have increased. The value of a right is derived as follows. Please see image, 8. Uncertainty and the premium for risk If the investor is uncertain about the future, he cannot tell for sure just what is the present worth of the dividends or of the interest and principal he will receive. He can only say that under one set of possible circumstances it will have one value and under another, another. Each of these possible values will have a different probability, however, and so the investor may draw a probability curve to express the likelihood that any given value, v, will prove to be the true value. Thus, if he is appraising a risky 20-year bond bearing a 4% coupon and selling at 40 to yield 12% to maturity, even though the pure interest seems to be only 4%, he may conclude that the probabilities are as shown in diagram 6. The various possible values, v, of the bond, from 0 to par, are shown by the abscissae of the curve, while the likelihood, f, that any given value will prove to be the true value, is shown by the ordinates. A unimodal curve, of the form usual for probability curves, could not be used in this case, because it would fail to show the relatively high chances of receiving all or none of the interest and principal. Whenever the value of a security is uncertain and has to be expressed in terms of probability, the correct value to choose is the mean value. The customary way to find the value of a risky security has always been to add a premium for risk to the pure interest rate, and then use the sum as the interest rate for discounting future receipts. In the case of the bond under discussion, which at 40 would yield 12% to maturity, the premium for risk is 8% when the pure interest rate is 4% strictly speaking, however, there is no risk in buying the bond in question if its price is right. Given adequate diversification, gains on such purchases will offset losses, and a return at the pure interest rate will be obtained. Thus the net risk turns out to be nil. To say that a premium for risk is needed is really an elliptical way of saying that payment of the full face value of interest and principal is not to be expected on the average. This leads to the mathematical definition of the premium for risk as the value of x that will satisfy the following two equations. If the mean value, v, is known, equation, i.e., can be solved for i, the proper yield. Or, if i is known, the same equation can be solved for v. The problem can be approached in either way. Most people are used to going about it in the latter way, however, and find it easier to think in terms of interest and principal at face value heavily discounted than in terms of interest and principal at reduced value lightly discounted. They think they can make a better estimate of the proper rate of discount in any given situation than of the various possibilities of partial or complete default. If they can, carrot their method has the advantage of being quicker and easier, because it requires the calculation of the present worth of one simple, instead of many varied, annuities. The final choice depends on whether the element of uncertainty in forecasts can be handled by the mind more easily in the one way or the other. Usually the method of using an enlarged discount rate will prove to be the simpler to think of, and so we shall generally employ it in the pages to follow. 9. Senior and junior issues of the same concern as everyone knows, the risk factor varies between the several securities of the same company. Usually the bonds are considered safer than the shares, with the underlying bonds having a better rating than the junior bonds, and the preferred stock than the common stock. Sometimes, however, this rule appears to be refuted by actual market prices, especially in the case of overcapitalized enterprises that nevertheless enjoy good speculative prospects. With such enterprises, the senior securities usually sell to give a high yield, the common stock a low yield. Yet, the market is quite right in thus reversing the usual rule, for if the venture should fail, the bondholders would lose much, but if it should succeed, they would gain little since all the profits in excess of stipulated interest would go to the common stockholders, who have but little to lose and much to gain. 
A notable instance of the foregoing was the United States Steel Corporation at the beginning of its career. As discussed in a later chapter, its senior securities sold to yield 6.5% on the average soon after it was formed, while its stock sold at a high price earnings ratio, because the success of the new trust was then still in doubt, although the company was thought to have great speculative possibilities. The proper yield on the common stock of such an enterprise is fixed and determined, after the manner of a dependent variable, once the proper yield on the senior securities and on the enterprise as a whole are agreed upon, as the following algebraic analysis shows. For simplicity a horizontal trend of earnings is assumed. See image. The foregoing formula shows the proper yield for a common stock once the fair yield for the senior securities and the enterprise as a whole have been decided upon. 10. The law of the conservation of investment value If the investment value of an enterprise as a whole is by definition the present worth of all its future distributions to security holders, whether on interest or dividend account, then this value in no wise depends on what the company's capitalization is. Clearly if a single individual or a single institutional investor owned all the bonds, stocks, and warrants issued by a corporation, it would not matter to this investor what the company's capitalization was. Any earnings collected as interest could not be collected as dividends. To such an individual it would be perfectly obvious that total interest and dividend paying power was in no wise dependent on the kind of securities issued to the company's owner. Furthermore, no change in the investment value of the enterprise as a whole would result from a change in its capitalization. Bonds could be retired with stock issues, or two classes of junior securities, i.e., common stock and warrants, could be combined into one, without changing the investment value of the company as a whole. Such constancy of investment value is analogous to the indestructibility of matter or energy. It leads us to speak of the law of the conservation of investment value, just as physicists speak of the law of the conservation of matter, or the law of the conservation of energy. Since market value does not usually conform exactly to investment value, no conservation of market value is to be found in general. Only to a rough extent do total market values remain the same regardless of capitalization. The exceptions in practice are important enough to afford many opportunities for profit by promoters and investment bankers. 2. Refunding operations If a bond issue matures, or if general interest rates decline enough to allow the replacement of a callable issue with another bearing a lower interest rate, a refunding operation may be undertaken that will alter the corporation's interest charges and change the investment value of its common stock. Since the distributable fraction of a company's quasi-rents is independent of its capital structure and is entirely available for taxes, interest, and dividends, any saving in interest can be used for dividends, and any increase in interest must come out of dividends. Hence the resulting increment or decrement in earnings per share must be capitalized at a different rate from the original earnings per share. If by refunding its bonds at a lower rate and replacing its preferred stock with low coupon notes, for instance, a company saves a dollar a share in senior charges, then, assuming that dividends are capitalized at 5%, and earnings at 10%, the usual rule of thumb, it adds $20 a share, and not 10, to the value of its common stock. If, on the other hand, a company is forced to refund a maturing issue at a higher rate, as might happen if its bonds came due during a banking crisis, then the decrease in earnings per share, resulting from the higher interest charges, would have to be capitalized at 20 times, and not at 10 as would an ordinary change in earnings. Twelve. Marketability Marketability, or salability, or liquidity, is an attribute of an investment to which many buyers of necessity attach great importance. Yet it would not be helpful to amend our definition of investment value in such a way as to make it take cognizance of marketability. Risk, to be sure, should be covered by the definition, as done above, but not marketability, for the inclusion of marketability would only lead to confusion. Better to treat intrinsic value as one thing, salability as another. Then we can say, for instance, that a given investment is both cheap and liquid, not that it is cheap partly because it is liquid. The latter phraseology would only raise the question of how much of the cheapness was due to liquidity and how much to other factors. To divorce liquidity, or salability, or marketability, 
from the concept of investment value is in conformity, moreover, with accepted usage outside the field of investment. In speaking of goods and services, for instance, one does not say that a pound of sugar is cheap at six cents because it is so, saleable. Nothing of the sort, for the sugar is bought for consumption and not for resale. By the same token, why should one say that a bond is cheap because it is so saleable? For if the bond is bought for investment, as by a life insurance company, it is not intended for resale at all, but for holding to maturity. Of course, if the buyer is a speculator, that is another matter, since investment value is only one of several things considered by a speculator. But even a speculator should not confuse salability with cheapness, any more than he should confuse popularity with cheapness. Just as market price determined by marginal opinion is one thing, and investment value determined by future dividends is another, so also salability is one thing and cheapness another. Likewise stability is a thing distinct from investment value, and from marketability as well. While the expected stability of the price of a security in future years is a consideration of great importance to some investors, particularly banks, yet it is not a component of investment value as the latter term ought to be defined. Many individual investors who buy and hold for income do not need to concern themselves with stability any more than with liquidity. Hence to include the concept of stability in the definition of investment value would only make investment value mean something different for each and every investor, according to his own personal need for stability as compared with other things. In conclusion, therefore, it may be said that neither marketability nor stability should be permitted to enter into the meaning of the term investment value.